Good morning, Johnson Ferry. So glad that you are here with us today. I want to welcome also those who are engaged online and worshiping from at home. We're so grateful to have every single one of you that are here. Some of you are here for the first time, maybe ever. Some for the first time in a long time. Some of you have uh, been with us for uh, much of the last you know, season in your life, and we're so grateful for that. You know, we've talked today about some heavy stuff already, just what we're watching in Afghanistan, what we're seeing uh, in our own neighborhoods with COVID, certainly what's happening in Haiti all over the world. It's just, it's a heavy season, and it's a good reminder, a painful reminder, but a good reminder that Jesus is enough, and that he is the rock on whom we build our lives. He is the stable foundation, and sometimes we only learn that through pain and suffering. That's at the heart of a lot of the series that we're doing called All In. And we're asking these questions each and every Sunday. Hey, are you all in with Jesus, and are you all in with Johnson Ferry? We have to ask that question because I think it's easy to kind of play religion. It's easy to kind of have one foot in, one foot out. And I just think the reality is, with the pressure of the world the way it is, uh, you either have to be all in or you're not in. And we want to make sure that we're the kind of people who are all in with Jesus. Now, that means a lot of things, but there's a, there's a language, a, a DNA, a code, if you will, that we are trying to instill in this series. And I'm going to put up this graphic. We've done it every single week. But there's these strategic words that we are trying to learn and hopefully embody. And they are the words connect, equip, multiply, and repeat. Now, every single week, I've asked you to say it. I'm going to do it again today. So if you guys would, loud and proud, would you say these four strategic words? What are they? Number one, they are to connect. Great job. And, and, and the reason we bring that up is that when we think about relaunching the church, what is at the heart of relaunch is not just how do we get a bunch of people back into the building. That's not really the goal. The goal is how do we embody the way of Jesus? How do we live out life the way that Jesus did? So we're talking a lot about connect, equip, multiply, and repeating. Connecting to God, certainly daily. Connecting with one another. If, if you ever hear someone who says, hey, I love Jesus, I'm just not really like a church person, that, that should send up a red flag to you to, to indicate maybe you don't really know Jesus because this is his church, this is his idea. And we need to be connected in gospel-driven community with one another. Today we're going to be talking about serving and how God has equipped all of us to serve and wants us to equip others to serve. And the next week we're going to talk about what it looks like to multiply. And then the word at the end is repeat. Connect, equip, multiply, repeat. It's not like you check the boxes like, okay, I connected, I equipped, I multiplied, I'm, I'm done. No, the reality is that we want this to become a lifestyle, that this is the way you live for Jesus from now to the time that your life is over. So today we're looking at equipped, to be equipped. What's that look like? Now we're going to look at a parable. We've been studying parables throughout the series in Matthew 25. So if you would take your Bible, if you don't have a Bible, look on to your neighbor's Bible. We'll have the verses on the screens. We're going to look at it in just a minute. But Matthew 25, verse 14. See, we're talking about being equipped. And to be equipped is to be given the necessary tools to accomplish some kind of function, some kind of purpose. And I bet you've had times in your life or you wanted to do something, but you didn't have the right tools to get it done. I can think of several different times in my life where that's happened, even just the last few weeks, last few months, last year, just, just little things. Like I remember probably about a year ago, I'm, I'm, I'm fishing with some friends of mine. I like to fly fish. I'm not an expert fly fisherman or anything, but I, I just love to get out there in the river and fish. And so I'm out there with some buddies, and one buddy's you know, way down the river over here, another buddy's down the river over here, and it's kind of a cold day, and I'm fishing. If you've ever been fly fishing, you know, tiny little flies, and... and I went to uh, take the really thin tippet, you know, which is the fly line, you know, the, the, the line, and put it through the, the fly, and I couldn't do it. And the reason is because I couldn't see the thing, right? I forgot to bring my glasses, all right? So I spent probably 30 to 45 minutes, literally with my hands shaking, just trying to guess how to get that stupid line through, through the fly. And, and I, you know, I, I finally did it, but, but it was impossible to do because I didn't have the tools I needed to do it. Because when I go out there, I have to have glasses. I don't even just wear my normal glasses. I wear like those old man, like clip it glasses. You know what I mean? I, 
You know, it's, by the way, it's funny. Somebody told me a couple years ago, you know, when you turn 40, your eyes are going to really change. I'm like, Pfft, whatever. Now I'm like, what has happened to my Bible? Like the words are getting so small <laughs> every single week. So I have to wear these a good bit of time so I can, I can kind of see this. But, but the reality is, if we follow God, if we are instilled by his Holy Spirit, he equips us to do the things that he wants us to do. We never lack for tools if we are doing the things in the way that God wants us to do them. Now, we're going to look at a parable today that's a very familiar parable, and it's a parable or a story that talks about people being given responsibilities and then having to give an account for what they did with those tools, with those responsibilities that were given to them. I told you to turn to Matthew 25, and Matthew 25 is right in the middle of this large teaching that Jesus is doing in Matthew 24 and 25 that we often call the Olivet Discourse. Now, that's not like a term that you probably know, but it just is a fancy way of saying Jesus was on the Mount of Olives, and he's talking about his second coming. And he talks about, like in verse 30 of chapter 24, that the Son of Man will come on the glory of the clouds, and you know, these beautiful images of the second coming of Christ. But he's teaching his disciples, here's how you live in light of that second coming. Now, the big surprise to a lot of Jewish people in Jesus' day was that there were apparently two stages to the coming of the Messiah. They, they thought there'd be one. You know, the world is going crazy, and this Messiah is going to come and fix everything on the spot. But Jesus actually said I, that he is not only the Messiah, but he's coming in two stages. The first time was at his birth, his incarnation. We celebrate Christmas to talk about his first coming. But then he says, at an undisclosed time, he's going to come again. And in Matthew 24 and 25, he tells a number of parables to teach his disciples what to do in between the first and the second coming. You see, there, there might be extremes we might go to. One would be to say, well, Jesus, if you're coming again, then this world doesn't really matter, the hurts, the pains, the trials, you know, whatever, this world's going to be destroyed anyways. I'm just waiting on the second coming, so, so come on, Jesus, and that would be one extreme. The other extreme, of course, would be to say, well, I mean, I guess Jesus is never coming back, so all that matters is the stuff that I can see, touch, feel, taste, experience here in this world. Earth. And Jesus actually said that we are to live with one foot raised, and that we are in this world, and yet we are awaiting his second coming. And so he tells a series of four parables in Matthew 25 that talk about what do you do while you're waiting. And I want to highlight this parable today because I think it gives us some necessary content about how, how do we serve Jesus between now and the time that he comes back? And what bearing does that have on what it will be like when he comes back? So that was what we're looking at today in this message called Equipped to Serve. So let's just jump right in. Matthew 25, verse 14 through 18. If you would stand now, and I want to read for you the beginning of this parable. He says that this is what it's like, you know, waiting for the second coming. Verse 14. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. The one who had received the five talents immediately went and did business with him and earned five more talents. In the same way, the one who had received the two talents earned two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, let me ask you, Johnson Ferry, what do you think the master thought about how his servants handled their talents? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, would you take this parable that you taught long ago and help us to know how we might live in light of your second coming. And we'll pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated.
So today we're gonna look at this parable and we're gonna try to understand just as people who wanna study the Bible seriously, what, what's the point of the parable? And then we want to flip it into our day and go, okay, what, what bearing does this parable have on us? Specifically as Johnson Ferry, what, what bearing does this parable have on how we are to live in light of it? So first, let's just look at the parable. There are three scenes I've called the moves. It's kind of like the way the, the scenes in a movie move from one to another. There are three scenes in this parable. You've probably heard this parable before, but let's go through them. Number one, we see the gifts. That's the first part, the gifts in verse 14 and 15. I just read it, but we see that Jesus is saying, look, it's like a man who went on a journey. Now, doesn't that make sense? Because he is about to go on a journey in the sense that he would die on the cross for our sins, be resurrected, defeating the power of hell, sin, and the grave. And it said 40 days later, after he arose from the grave, he ascended, he went away to get ready one day to come back again. So this parable is appropriate because it's like a man, let's just say a master, who was going to go on a journey, and then he entrusts these great possessions to his slaves. That's the Greek word doulos, it means slave, which is an appropriate word for how Jesus teaches this parable. And it says that he gives the slaves different amounts of what he calls talents. Now, you heard the story. Three servants, the first servant got how many talents? You tell me. Five. The second got... And the third got one. Yeah, five, two, and one. Now, the question is, what is a talent? It's hard to know, to be honest with you, and scholars are all over the map in terms of what a talent was, how much it, it was worth, because you know, tracing currency and equivalency to today and all that is very, very difficult to do. I've seen it all over the map. Some uh, said that a talent is 6,000 days wages. Some say it's 10,000 days wages. Some say it's 15 years Wages, And if you just took the math on that last one, let's say that a talent was 15 years wages. And if you make, let's say you make $50,000 a, a year. So that's $136 a day. So if you took your 50,000 and did it times 15 years, which is about, what, $745,000. And then let's say that you got five of those, you're talking well over $3 million. Now, the reason I say that is because these servants were given a lot. It's not like the master gave them something little that he didn't care what they do with it. I mean, he entrusted a lot to them, five of these, two of these. Even one of them would be a lot of money. Now, Jesus in the story is using talent as a currency. It's money. And you're already like me. You're like, well, what's that have to do with my life? Well, God still gives us money, and he expects us to be good stewards of it. But I think appropriately, we could think about talents being extended to a number of different things money. It could be opportunities that come your way. Maybe the Lord, you know, opens some kind of door for you. That's an opportunity. Do you take it or not? You know, that's a talent. Some of you have literal talents in different ways to serve the Lord. You have spiritual gifts. We're going to look at those a little bit later in the message about spiritual gifts that God gives to you to use for his glory, his kingdom. Even your life, I mean, just the days of your life, you know, we're not promised tomorrow. We don't know how long we're going to live. Some of us get a longer run, some of us get a shorter run, but, but that, in a sense, is a talent, this kind of degree of measurement, and God is holding us responsible. This master gave his servants great gifts. They had different capabilities. It said that he gave it according to their ability. Now, that doesn't mean that one was more important than the other, but one was a five-talent person, one was a two-talent person, one was a one-talent person. I know we all like to be in the five talent group, <laughs> but who knows? We all have capabilities, and God gives us, according to our capabilities, talents. Well, he's given gifts. Number two, let's look at the work. Number two is the work. What do they do with these talents? Well, we read it, but in verse 16 and 18, we see that there's a contrast now that's set up between the first two and the last one. Remember now, the first two got five and two. The last one got one. The first two in 16, 18, notice these, these action verbs, right? The one who received the five talents immediately went. He went out, and he did business with them. I mean, he put them to work, and he earned five more talents. He went out. He did business with it. He earned. 
Notice the action in these words. The same is implied of the second one who did the same thing. But notice the contrast with the third servant who in verse 18, when he received the one talent, he didn't go out with it. It said he went away with it. And he didn't do business with it. He dug a hole with it. And he didn't earn anything off of it. He hid his master's money. Now, what we're going to see in this parable is that it's not so much the amount of money that matters. It's the attitude, it's the work that accompanies the money that they were given. So this parable's moving along. We see, all right, we get the gifts, we get the work, but now we get the point, which is number three, the evaluation. The evaluation. This is kind of where Jesus is kind of moving the story as it relates to them living in light of his coming. So the evaluation, let's look at it, verse 19. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have earned five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of of your master. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have earned two more talents, his master said to him. Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. So let's just stop there. The first two guys are similar. They were given different amounts of money, but they essentially did the same thing. They doubled the value. The first one with five made five more, so he ended up with 10. The second one with two gave two more. He ended up with four. They they took what they had, and they doubled it for the master. Now, maybe that's your talent. Maybe you have a unique ability to take money and to just double it. And if that is you, I would like to meet you after the service and just have a conversation. I'd like to get to know you just a little bit. But the point is not, is not the money. The point isn't the money. The point is that they maximized what God had given to them. It, it reminds me of the story that Jesus told about the widow. Remember that widow at the temple? You know, everyone's giving money, and they're making a big show about it, about how much money they gave, and named the building after me, and here's my big check, and, you know, horns and trumpets and all, all that kind of stuff. And Jesus honestly wasn't even that impressed with any of them. Why? Because he knew that, yes, they gave a great amount of money, but, man, they had a lot in their bank account. But then he looked at this little widow, two little coins, and she gave all of it. That's what impresses Jesus. You know, I think think there's going to be a lot of people in heaven that we will find out impressed Jesus way more than the people on this earth that we think impressed Jesus. There are people in this church, to be honest with you, who... I think are some of the most impressive people and they don't always get the highlight reel, the notoriety. I could throw out a list of them. You know, one that comes to mind are the the volunteers and the parents in our shine ministry. One of the great ministries we do at Johnson Ferry is our shine ministry, our special needs ministry. It is incredible, incredible what God is doing there. And and I look at the parents and the burden that they bear and this relentless 24-7 taxing, tireless love that they have for their kids. And it's often a role that they don't feel seen or maybe aren't seen by many people. I want to tell you, you sees them, God sees them. This master looked at these servants and he said, good and faithful, well done. Enter the joy of your master. If the parable ended right there, we think, well, that's, that's who we want to be. But Jesus offers a contrast. Look in verse 24 through 28. We hear about the third servant, verse 24. Now, the one who had received the one talent also came up and said, Master, I, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. And I was afraid So I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you still have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, you worthless, lazy slave. Did you not know that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter seed? 
then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take the talent away from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. Now, you feel the contrast, right? I mean, the, the first two guys, they doubled it. They were commended, good and faithful, well done, enter the joy. This guy starts out with the language you think would be good, you know, master. And then he says, I know you to be a hard man, reaping where you do not sow. Yeah, I mean, you're making money where you don't sleep. You have a footprint larger than your life. I, I know the scale of your power and your glory, O oh master. And, and the tragic irony as this man knows the right things about his master, but he doesn't live any different in light of it. And it might sound like, well, he's a servant too. I mean, he starts with the word master, but Jesus will tell a parable here in a little bit that says there's gonna be some people that even use the words Lord, Lord, and Jesus will say, I, I didn't know you. And the servant, instead of, instead of capitalizing on the great prominence and power of his master hid the money and did nothing with it. And he's not commended for it. In fact, in the parable, the master says, you are worthless and you are lazy. These are, those are tough words. He says, at a minimum, you've, you could have taken it to the bank and earned a little interest off of it. That's an interesting footnote, by the way, not really part of the, the parable. It's just interesting. When you look at the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, charging interest is always seen as a sin from Israelite to Israelite. Uh, they were allowed in the Old Testament to charge interest to Gentiles, um, but never to one another. In fact, one of the great sins they committed and they were chided for in the Old Testament was when Israelites started charging other Israelites for interest. They were merely to loan out of mercy within the covenant of God. It's interesting, however, when Jesus tells parables about the bank, they're both seen positively. Uh, here in another parable, um, he says, you should make interest, you make money off of this interest. Now, that's, that's not Jesus somehow putting forth an economic policy or a, a banking policy. It's just, it's just interesting, the difference here. And he's saying, look, if the world does it, you could have at least done that, but no, you are a wicked and lazy slave. Now, in our culture today, we don't always prize the things that Jesus prizes here. Because in this parable, the servants who are prized are those who work, those who do business, those who earn, and those who enjoy. And we live in a world where, quite honestly, we, we have a lot of people who want to take but don't want to give. We have tons of people in our world today, in our country today, who, who don't mind taking a check and don't want to earn by doing the work. Paul even said in 2 Thessalonians 3 that, look, if there's someone within the body of Christ, and he's not talking to the world at large, but even within the church, look, there's someone in the church that, that in the name of godliness or waiting for the second coming or something that doesn't want to work, then he shouldn't eat. Now, that doesn't mean that we earn our salvation and have to work our way to God. But once you are a child of God, there is this expectation that that we work, that we earn, that we strive for the things that God wants us to do with what he gives us in his life. Well, we end the parable in verse 29 and 30, and notice what happens. Jesus says, for to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance, but from the one who does not have, even when he does not have, shall be taken away and throw the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, we're still in the parable here, but in this parable, the one who did nothing with the money, it was given to the one who was producing with the money. And the one who did nothing with the money, he was taken to a place of punishment. And Jesus ends so many of his parables with these kind of warning passages, even if they're just metaphor, for judgment to come. Now, if you had to stop right here and go, Clay, what, what is the point of this parable? I mean, he's speaking largely to, to followers of Jesus, though maybe not everyone here is a follower of Jesus. Maybe you're kind of like the third servant who you say, Master, but when I look at your life, there's really no evidence to show that you're doing anything 
with what God has given to you. But you say, you know, what's, what's the point of this parable? I would say it like this. What God gives now, he will ask about later. Pretty simple. But what God gives you now in your life, these talents, he is going to ask about them later. Again, what is Jesus doing? He's teaching about the second coming, that he's going away like this master on a journey, but one day the master will come back and there will be a reckoning. There will be a giving of account. And in the same way, what God gives us now, he will one day ask about later. So let's think about that for our church. We're talking about going all in. We want to be all in with Jesus. What's that look like? Well, it means that we're serving the body of Christ. So here are questions we need to ask of, of one another, of ourselves. Here's, here's the first question. It'd be this. What are my talents? What, what are the talents that God has given to me? Did you know that you have talents and gifts that God has given to you? You may wonder, well, I've, you know, I've heard about spiritual gifts. What is a spiritual gift? Well, let me give you a definition, and I love this one because I came up with it. But here it is. What is a spiritual gift? A spiritual gift is an ability given and empowered by the Holy Spirit to help build up the ministry, maturity, and multiplication of the local church. Now, the gifts of the Spirit are not necessarily the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, peace, you know, peace patience, kind, long-suffering, all those that you see in Galatians. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's what happens when I live in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm more loving, I'm more kind, I'm more faithful, all those things. That's, not the, that's the fruit of the Spirit. But I'm talking about every single one of you, if you are an authentic follower of Jesus, if you are all in with Him, He has given all of you a spiritual gift. Notice a couple passages. There are two or three strategic passages in the New Testament that talk about spiritual gifts. Here, here are two of them. One's in Romans 12. Notice the list of gifts here. However, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to use them properly. And then he goes through a couple of the gifts. If prophecy and a portion of one's faith. If service in the act of serving. If, one, if, there's, if the one who teaches in the act of teaching or the one who exhorts in the work of exhortation, the one who gives with generosity, the one who is in leadership with diligence, the one who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. This is not all the gifts. And just because you don't have a gift, it's not like you don't have to do it. It's not like, well, you know, God, I'd love to give, but I just don't have the gift of generosity. That's just not, not my gift. We're all called to give. But some people are, are more gifted in giving than others. Some people are more gifted in leadership than others. Ephesians 4 talks about some of the gifts and the, even the offices that come with those gifts in the church. Ephesians 4. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping, there's our word, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Now, why do we equip the saints to do ministry? Listen to this for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Now, I know that's a mouthful. I love Ephesians, by the way. We're going to teach Ephesians after this series. We're going to do a long series through Ephesians. I can't wait for that. But the motive of these gifts and offices within the local church, notice, is what? to build up the unity of the faith that we might become a mature man. In other words, that we will not be as mature of a church if you are not all using the gifts to build up Johnson Ferry. So we are called to build up the church, specifically the ministry, the maturity, and the multiplication of the local church. You know, we live in a world that loves to talk about things like finding your purpose and making a difference, and, and those aren't bad words. We just need to be careful because often we apply those to things about like starting businesses or being entrepreneurs or being happier or making money or whatever, and those, those things can be good, but God gives gifts and talents specifically that you might build up his church. So what are you doing 
with the talents, with the gifts that God has given to you? That's the second question. What am I doing with this gift? What am I doing with this gift? The obvious takeaway from the parable is that these two servants were commended because they multiplied the gift that God gave to them. That's not to say that we have to double the gift. I mean, it'd be hard to know if, if you're gifted in teaching, how do you double the gift? I mean, that's not the point. The point is, how do you maximize this gift that God has given to you? And are you even using that here in the body of Christ? If I came up to each and every single one of you and said, hey, tell me, tell me about where you are serving either here or larger in some way the kingdom of God. Where, where are you doing that right now? Tell me, what's your answer to that? What would you say? If you're wondering, are there any areas here that we could serve? I would say yes, hundreds of them. There are a ton of areas to serve here at Johnson's Ferry. In fact, if you're interested to learn more, before you take off today, stop by the atrium. There's some folks at the tables who would love to give you a list of some great ways to serve. We even have some folks over here in our dogwood room, right off the atrium, that are giving out spiritual gifts inventories today. So if you want to learn more about a spiritual gifts test or something, stop by there today. But we did come up with a list of, of kind of a big four, if you will. Not, these aren't the only ways to serve, but you're saying, hey, are there some strategic opportunities to serve here at Johnson Ferry? I would say yes, and I would challenge some of you to think about serving one of these four areas. What are they? Well, the first one is our connection ministry. Coming out of the last year and a half, this is such a huge ministry of hospitality, standing at doors, driving carts in the parking lot, welcoming people, helping people know where to go on a Sunday morning. Just that gospel hospitality. If, if you're a hospitable person, if you're the person that makes others feel, feel great, if you're great at encouraging people, welcoming people, you have a friendly face, this would be a great ministry for you to get involved with, our connection ministry. Number two, our next generation ministry. Kids, students, such a huge part of who we are. If you want to make a big difference for the kingdom of God, invest in this next generation. God is doing some great things there, especially preschool. One thing I figured out in the last year, we, did, we have had a COVID boom in this church. I'll tell you that. Because our preschool ministry is booming. So people have been busy over the last year and a half in this church. And for all those kids that are coming, they, they need people who will love them and plant those seeds of the gospel, even, even at this earliest of age. You can make a huge difference. Preschool. Number three, I already mentioned our Shine Ministry, an incredible ministry, where honestly, you will be blessed to take part in. And number four, our media ministry. As we have shifted more to an online ministry and had more things online, it, it's, it's up the need for... People with those technical skills do audio, visual, cameras, soundboards, all, all kinds of things. And you could use those gifts to serve here. So whether it's one of those four or 400 other things in which you can get involved in, the, the real question is this, what are you doing with those gifts? All right, here's the third question. We're gonna wrap up with this. In the parable, the servants had to give an account, right? And so here's the question for us. What will I experience at the final judgment? That's probably not a question you think about a whole lot. Because you're thinking, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to be judged. Well, have you read the New Testament? Because you will stand in judgment to God. Now, before you say, well, hold on. Oh, what about Jesus and all he did on the cross? Understand what I mean by that. The New Testament says that there will be rewards for believers in heaven. There's a couple of quick points we need to make because we need to understand what the Bible says, and I'm not going to nearly have time to give it the sufficient answer it needs, but just a couple points because maybe you've never even thought about this. Maybe you're new to church, you're like, rewards in heaven, what are you talking about? Here's a couple of things. Number one, believers will be judged. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says that we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for what we did with what he gave to us. Remember, what God gives, he'll ask about later. But number two, don't worry, this is not a cause for fear. 
I mean, Romans 8 says that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. This is not a judgment to figure out, you know, did I get in or not? Did I really believe in Jesus or not? No, no, no. That was settled when you said yes to Jesus and you repented of your sin and you gave your life to him and he forgave you of your sin. That was settled forever whenever you put your faith in Jesus. But you will still stand in front of the King of Kings. Number three, there will be degrees of rewards in the kingdom. We don't know exactly what that looks like. It's kind of a mystery in the New Testament. It doesn't tell us, but it does say that, that there will be some kind of reward in heaven for how we lived on the earth. Number four, our joy will be complete. The servant said to these servants who doubled the money, he said, enter into the joy of your master. You, you won't feel slighted or resentful for whatever you get or don't get in heaven. Why? Because your joy will be complete in Jesus. And then number five, rewards are a cause for encouragement, not competition. We don't run around going, well, I'm going to serve in the preschool because I want a bigger house than her in heaven. That, that's not why we do it. Hebrews 10 says that, that we should encourage one another, stimulate one another, literally shake up one another to love and good deeds. And all the more as we see the day, what's the day? The day of the second coming drawing near. See, this world is temporary. I was reading a bedtime story to my seven-year-old the other night, Miller, and you know, we're reading a Bible story, and it's about Jesus dies on the cross and is resurrected. She's seven, so she's trying to kind of put all that together. Not yet a believer or anything, you know, she's trying to figure that all out. And uh, so she said, Dad, how come, why did Jesus leave and go in the sky and he didn't come back? That's a great question. And I'm thinking, how do I answer that with like the doctrine of the Holy Spirit? I explain that to a seven. You know, I'm like, well, he, I mean, he, he, didn't, he didn't leave, but he left his spirit with us. And when, when you become a believer in Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwells in you and you have God within you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. But it's not like he is leaving and never coming back. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus left to go prepare a place for us. And sometimes we forget that that this world with all its troubles and sins and heartbreak and death, and terrorism, this world is temporary. I, I love what Randy Alcorn says, that Jesus not only went to prepare a place for us, but he is now preparing us for that place. And the reason we serve and give is that we build up the body practicing now we will do forever and ever with Jesus. You have a gift, you have a talent, you have money, you have opportunities. God has equipped you to serve. The question is, where are you serving? Father, we thank you for the gifts that you've given to us. I pray that we would use them for your glory and for your good to build up the body of Christ. Lord, you know the gifts and the talents in this room, and you know how you've wired people and gifted people. And if there's anyone here today who is kind of sitting on the sidelines, Lord, would today they, they go all in with you, find a way to serve, find a way to get plugged in, find a way, Father, to make a difference for you. And God, if there's anyone here that's like that third servant who maybe knows the language master, but is not really living out the things of the gospel, maybe because they're not really a true servant of yours. And I would pray that today is a day of salvation, that they would give their life to you, repent and turn to you. Thank you for your gospel. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. It's your name we pray.